Good afternoon and welcome to the latest in our series of ENO Center for Transportation webinars. ENO is an independent, nonpartisan, and nonprofit think tank that shapes public debate on critical multimodal transportation issues and builds an innovative network of transportation professionals. My name is Brianne Eby and I'm a senior policy analyst at ENO. And today we're discussing workforce and procurement issues as they relate to bus electrification with Dr. Christy Veter. Christy is the National Program Director at Jobs to Move America, where she leads research on the ways in which public spending can maximize civic benefits. During Christy's presentation, you can enter questions in the box on the side of your screen at any point, and we'll get to as many questions as we can uh, during the Q&A at the end of this session. And after this live presentation, you can find slides and a recording of the webinar on our website, enotrans.org. The recording will also be emailed to all registrants within one day. With that, I will turn it over to Christy. Thank you, Brianne. Okay, there we go. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you today. Uh, I'm Christy Veter. I'm the National Program Director at Jobs to Move America. Uh, Jobs to Move America, our main focus is on finding ways to democratize the procurement process to capture as many different kinds of uh, civic, economic, equity, environmental benefits as possible. And um, we do a lot of work with transit agencies. And uh, because of that, I've been thinking and talking and, and reading and learning a lot about uh, electric buses for the last several years. And it's been uh, a really terrific process and I've learned a lot along the way. Um, I'm gonna be talking uh, mostly about battery electric buses today, uh, mainly because those are you know, far and away the, the, the ones with the greatest levels of deployment in the country right now. Although I think fuel cell electric buses are really interesting also, and um, there seems to be lots of indications that they will also be a really important part of the transit vehicle landscape um, down the line. Uh, um, and a lot of the things that um, I'm going to be talking about apply to zero emission buses generally. So I'll be sort of going back interchangeably between zero emission buses and battery electric buses. Um, so uh, so why, why battery electric buses? Uh, to those of you who work or follow the transit sector, there has been um, rapidly growing, in, in, rapidly increasing interest in battery electric buses for a number of years now. Uh, everybody loves the fact that they have zero tailpipe emissions. Their greenhouse gas emissions are significantly lower than uh, diesel, uh, diesel buses and um, compressed natural gas buses, even though they are charged on, on an electric grid in the US that's still largely powered with fossil fuels. Uh, and they also emit zero criteria pollutants, which is really, really um, important from a public health perspective. Uh, respiratory health is certainly something that we all think about and value a lot more highly now, I think, um, than we did before the pandemic. Um, that's a uh, really important consideration for the communities that live around bus yards, that live along um, uh, roadways that are heavily traveled by buses and other medium and heavy duty vehicles. Uh, and um, you know, there's a lot of uh, research documenting about how the folks in those communities tend to be most often um, people um, uh, in low income communities and also people of color. Uh, the, the low pollutants that come from battery electric buses is also really terrific from an occupational health standpoint. Uh, there's also a lot of literature documenting that the health impacts that diesel bus workers experience and other, other people that spend a lot of time around diesel engines. Uh, and also really importantly, um, there's, been, there's every reason to believe that uh, electric buses will save money over the long term uh, due to their very efficient engines, the likelihood that fueling buses with electricity um, will be more cost effective partially due to the much more stable prices in electricity markets compared to fossil fuel markets. Uh, and also that electric buses will have lower maintenance costs over time thanks to their simpler, more efficient engines that don't have different fluids that need to be changed the way internal combustion engines do. Uh, and so 
for um, increasingly, uh, with every passing year up until the beginning of 2020, there was a lot of momentum nationwide about converting transit fleets to electric buses. Uh, pretty much every major transit agency had established fleet transition goals, usually with a full transition date of around 2030 to maybe 2040. And many, many more smaller agencies had announced pilot programs so that they could start testing out uh, manageable numbers of electric buses in their fleets and getting used to how they run and how, how they want to deploy them. Uh, and then, of course, a little over a year ago, um, that and, and many, many other things came to an abrupt halt. Uh, I live in New York City, and the, um, the, the, the challenges that COVID-19 wreaked on our mass transit here were just very, very scary for lots of different reasons. Um, there were the, the health impacts to transit workers, there was the, the plummeting ridership, the significant increases in operating costs, um, costs for PPE and for cleaning, and of course the decreased fare revenues and also tax revenues. And um, it was, there were a lot of questions at the time about how uh, the New York MTA and many other transit agencies were going to stay afloat during a time when cities really, really needed effective ways to transport essential workers, um, many of whom rely heavily on public transit. And uh, you've probably seen versions of this plot from different places. The numbers very slightly depend on um, where the data is being collected from, but I thought this one showed the different uh, um, transit markets very nicely. The dark green is the US average. Um, these are all numbers comparing 2020 to, I believe, ridership um, for the previous year. The light green is New York City, dark blue is Chicago, and yellow is San Francisco. Um, and you can see this very sharp decline in uh, March, going into April, and then um, numbers coming back. And right now we're staying somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of, of what typical ridership would be. And so this raises a lot of questions, even now as we're coming back from the pandemic, and um, it's wonderful to see vaccines being distributed. Uh, so voluminously, um, this is a article that appeared not too long ago in the New York Times. The subway needs riders to save it, will they? There's still a lot of questions about how people are going to go back to the new normal now that uh, coronavirus is winding down. Um, what kinds of office spaces will people be wanting to go to? Uh, how, how, you know, has the, the normalcy of working from home, how is that gonna carry over going forward? Lots of lots of questions, uh, and this rather dark, somewhat foreboding image to go along with this article. And um, a couple months before this article came out, uh, Streets Blog NYC did a, a very comprehensive interview with Craig Cipriano of um, MTA Bus, uh, and you know they they talked about what were the likelihoods for um, MTA going forward with their fleet, electric fleet conversion. Uh, a lot of that was anticipated to be paid for by congestion pricing, which finally passed in New York State after many years of, of battling. Um, however, that's all on hold for the time being. And so definitely lots of questions here in New York. However, um, uh, it, you know, I'm not sure, uh, I'd be interested to hear what folks on this uh, webinar think, but I've been really um, surprised and, and very uh, hopeful to see a bunch of different headlines coming out just over the last couple months. Washington, D.C., Nashville, San Diego, expanding their electric fleet, uh, Chicago Transit, testing more electric buses. Um, there are, there definitely seem to be lots of reasons to be hopeful, even though plenty of questions still remain. Um, but it's, it's definitely inspiring to see so many agencies uh, making positive statements and moving forward with their electric bus programs, even if it might be more tentative than it than you know they might have anticipated a little over a year ago. Um, I think one of the reasons for this is that there's lots of really strong signals coming from DC that there's going to be strong federal support for electrifying transit. I love this photo of our our new president from back when he was on the campaign trail with his no malarkey bus. Uh, I think if, if anybody can get uh, Americans to start being interested in mass transit uh, 
as, as a positive alternative to individual passenger vehicles, it's, it's probably Biden. Um, his American Jobs Plan proposed doubling transit funding to 85 billion. There was a, a number in there about electrifying 50,000 diesel transit vehicles, which is definitely the big majority of what, I, uh, what is approximately a 70,000 uh, vehicle national transit bus fleet. And as you, you probably noted, there is a lot of emphasis all throughout the American Jobs Plan on creating good jobs and expanding clean transportation options um, for, for all communities around the country. Uh, and that goes along with growing support for, from Congress for zero emission buses and zero emission vehicles generally. Uh, the Clean Future Act, which I believe was introduced last month by the House Energy and Commerce Committee, included $25 billion for electric school buses and charging equipment. Um, electric school buses are really sort of surging ahead in, in public discourse this year. Uh, and then also about the same time, Senators Markey and Warren and Representatives Andy Levin and Ex Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez introduced the Build Green Act, which uh, featured 500 billion over 10 years to electrify all kinds of mass transit vehicles and heavy duty vehicles, including transit buses. And some of you may remember the proposal that then Minority Leader Schumer released in 2019, the Clean Cars for America proposal, which was um, a very ambitious, very worker positive um, plan for creating incentives to dramatically increase the purchases of uh, zero emission passenger vehicles. Um, I think that it, it wouldn't be a big surprise to see a similar kind of proposal come to the fore from the Senate uh, covering the same ideas for the transit sector, given all the other momentum that we're seeing on these other fronts. Um, it'll be interesting to watch and, and see what may happen on that. Uh, and then last summer, in the middle of the pandemic, 15 states and the District of Columbia uh, signed the medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicle memorandum of understanding, which set targets of 30% medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicle sales by 2030, and that increases to 20 uh, to 100% by 2050, uh, and that would include buses. So um, I think you know we have kind of the strongest picture that that one could hope for given all the um, challenges and um, huge obstacles that America and you know everybody else in the world has faced over the past year. Um, it's really exciting to see this resurgence of interest and um, uh, I think there's there's lots of reasons to be optimistic. Um, all of that is is really exciting uh, from you know moving transit into the 21st century perspective. Accompanying that are a lot of very complex questions that um, have to do with how this impacts uh, different kinds of workers. And um, there's pretty well established protocols, I'd say at this point, for training bus operators on how to drive electric buses. Um, because of the regenerative, regenerative braking that those buses have, uh, there's a lot of things that can be done that the operator of the bus can do to drive the bus in a way to maximize the range of the battery. Uh, it's in that sense they're very different from diesel buses. Uh, what's been what what is um, what what it seems like there's still area for improvement on is how transit maintenance workers, bus maintenance workers, um, are brought along in this transition to electric buses. And um, one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning was the anticipation that uh, electric buses with their simpler, more efficient engines would um, save transit agencies money over time because of their lower maintenance needs. And this is, you know, I think in, in most respects, a really positive outcome. Um, you know, one hoped for uh, result of that is that transit agencies would um, be able to expand their transit service to serve more communities that really need it. But it's a very concerning possibility for bus maintenance workers who see, see that this is one of the main selling points for electric buses and think to themselves, well, 
how much longer does that mean I'm going to have my job for? And looking around on the shop floor and looking, seeing, you know, your your maintenance worker coworkers and wondering how many of us are, are going to be here in five, 10 or 15 years? That's a really serious question. And um, one of the things that I think we, we want to make sure we don't do is uh, is have this transition to this new technology cost people their livelihoods um, in a way that that may be very painful for a lot of workers. Um, what's What further complexifies this situation is the fact that electric buses are still far from their ideal design state, I think it's fair to say. Um, there is data that's continuously being gathered on this, and a lot of great reports have been published by uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratories on how um, how much energy the buses require, um, what the fueling costs are, what the maintenance needs and costs are. All of these are moving targets. <clears throat> and I think there's every reason to believe that over time, as the engineering and the design of these buses improves, that these reduced maintenance needs will start to appear. Um, I think it's going to be a while, though, before we get there. Uh, a lot of data continues to be gathered on electric buses, but we're still definitely you know, a ways away from having a full uh, bus life cycle, a full 12 years worth of performance data. And even when, we, when we're able to get that first 12 years of data, um, we're going to need to take it probably with a lot of grains of salt because the design of the buses is changing so much over time. And so the way buses performed in the first 12 years of having electric buses and transit fleets I think is unlikely to be representative of how those how the next generation of buses performs in the next 12 years. Um, and uh, I was reading recently the FTA's Transit Vehicle Innovation Deployment Center advisory panel report that came out a couple months ago. Uh, it phrased it really nicely. Um, one representative of a large transit agency likened zero emission buses to the position of rail transit operators in the early 1990s when the industry was beginning to transition to modern information technology infrastructure and new electronic controls. He noted the industry knew significant changes were coming but could not identify all the needs from day one. Another representative from a large agency noted his agency is still in a trial and error approach with both planning and maintenance. Uh, that has been consistent with the information that I've learned from my conversations with transit workers, both on the management side and on the maintenance side over the last several years. And I think it's it's very likely to continue to be the case for some time. Um, although, you know, we are seeing lots of improvements all the time as reports like this one and other ones continue to come out and uh, best practices and knowledge sharing proliferates throughout the transit sector. Um, one thing that I think is important to keep in mind as we move forward and look for ways to bring maintenance workers along with the transition is um, avoiding the, the need for relying on extended warranties to service electric buses. Uh, this electric, uh, pardon me, extended warranties are certainly expedient when um, you know an agency that may be running on tight budget and especially you know everything is tighter and um, more challenging as, as agencies are coming back from COVID, but it can be, um, you know, very understandable to want to sign up for a long-term warranty and outsource the maintenance of the bus over time. Um, however, I think this points to a much larger sort of more structural issue in terms of how agencies manage, uh, like continue to train their maintenance workers. And um, this is something that the Transit Vehicle Innovation Deployment Center report discusses. and. Um, the Transportation Learning Center, which Jobs to Move America works with closely, has also been uh, very um, focused on tackling this issue. And um, we've actually been working with them to help them develop best procurement practices for how agencies can uh, include in their procurements um, language that can really help them get quality, comprehensive training for their maintenance workers to help those maintenance workers understand fully how to confidently take care of electric buses. Uh, based on the research that the Transit Transportation Learning Center has done over time, they currently estimate that about 20% of the, 
of maintenance workers at transit agencies generally have the basic skills needed to maintain electric buses. And that's not a very high percentage. Um, it can be very hard, very, it's, a, it's a, a big challenge for agencies to have enough workers to, to both take care of the buses that need to go out into service every day and also be able to spare some maintenance workers who can then go on to get trained to develop the skills that they need to keep up with the technology that the transit agency has. Um, this is, I think um, folks can, can acknowledge that this has been a challenge for some time, but uh, the fact that we're now shifting to this, these new types of vehicles with these new technologies is perhaps like the, the sort of watershed moment that can really um, be the perfect turning point for creating these opportunities to upskill maintenance workers. Um, and the FDA report actually has a lot of great ideas uh, for the kinds of incentives and supports that can be offered to transit agencies, particularly associated with federal funding to make that happen. Uh, I know Transportation Learning Center is um, hoping to be able to um, share out their uh, procuring for training language um, possibly as soon as within the next month or two. Um, so when those things become available, that'll be really terrific for, for everybody. Uh, in general, in the meantime, and um, for lots of things, not just with um, training maintenance workers for electric buses, the, to the degree to which transit agencies can bring workers to the table for the planning discussions, for the procurement preparation, for discussing the RFPs, having them involved, having workers involved in those discussions uh, can be really, really valuable from a range of perspectives, um, not least of which for acknowledging the, you know, the, the ongoing effort that workers put into keeping these fleets going all the time. Um, and so that would be a terrific place to start uh, as we um, hopefully wait for the, the very imminent introduction of, of other, other mechanisms that can help upskill maintenance workers. Uh, on the agency side. Uh, there's also the really interesting question of what can be done through the procurement process to incentivize the creation of good jobs for the maintenance workers that, I'm sorry, for the manufacturing workers that build the buses that the transit agencies uh, then put into their fleets. Uh, this, is, this is where um, Jobs to Move America has really focused, its, it focused its work since our beginning as an organization. Um, the question that we oriented ourselves around is when any government agency and transit agencies are an excellent one to sort of begin with because they procure such large amounts of manufactured goods um, at, at any given time, what can be done to, to uh, maximize the chances that when agencies, including transit agencies, do large procurements, like for electric buses or, or like for subway cars, uh, to make sure that the, the jobs that, that can be created on the manufacturing side associated with that procurement can be good ones, good jobs, and that they can be American jobs. And that they can, you know, as we, since we're gonna be spending this money anyway to put these vehicles on the road, why not capture the full range of benefits that's possible both for the folks at the transit agency, for the constituents that the transit agency serves, and for the workers that are going to, to build this equipment in the first place. Uh, the, this is really um, valuable to think about because of, of the significance that the manufacturing sector continues to hold in the American economy. Although, uh, admittedly, manufacturing isn't, isn't the central pillar of, of our GDP that it was in the 60s and 70s, it's, it's still a, a pretty important part of, of what keeps America going. There are, before the pandemic, there were 13 million people who you, worked in the US manufacturing sector. Uh, manufacturing comprised over half of all US exports. Um, in 2012, Susan Helper, who went on to be the chief economist for um, Department of Commerce, I believe, uh, found in an article that she did with several colleagues that Within the manufacturing sector, transportation equipment was one of four subsectors that had the highest impact in terms of generating high wage jobs, spurring commercial innovation, and reducing trade deficits. And manufacturing jobs are still um, really good jobs and 
uh, jobs that require high levels of skill, uh, pretty sophisticated levels of technical training, but can also be performed by people who don't have a college degree or maybe have limited high school education. Um, so it's, it can be a really powerful career pathway for people from a lot of different kinds of backgrounds. Uh, and there's a real need to make the manufacturing workforce more uh, equitably accessible to different kinds of workers. For a long time, the manufacturing workforce in America was about 70% white and 80% male. Uh, there's a, a, unfortunately a long history of people of color having limited access to manufacturing jobs. There's also you know, a well-documented racial wage gap, which exists um, both for uh, workers that got hired into higher level jobs in the manufacturing sector and also just the same for, for workers that were in the lower sec the, the lower, less skilled, lower paid parts of the manufacturing world, which unfortunately were the jobs that people of color were um, in the past most likely to be shunted into. Uh, there are similar disadvantages for women in manufacturing, despite the fact that surveys have shown that women find manufacturing careers to be really rewarding and engaging. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of it has to do also with the fact that manufacturing isn't the same kind of work that it used to be. It's highly computerized. Uh, it's, it's not the dark, dangerous, dirty job that I think um, people might have thought it once was. And there are major hiring needs in the manufacturing sector. Um, you, you don't read much manufacturing literature before you start learning about uh, the struggle that many employers face trying to find workers to fill the jobs that they have available. Um, a lot of this has to do with the fact that, um, you know, as the manufacturing sector has shrunk, unfortunately, uh, fewer and fewer workers have gone into those jobs and more and more of those workers are aging out of those jobs. And so there are fewer people who know somebody who work in manufacturing who uh, can then see them, you know, look to their, their colleague or their relative or their neighbor who has that manufacturing job and think to themselves, oh yeah, I could do that too. Um, there just isn't as much of that going on. And so there's a huge need to expand recruitment. And I think that a lot of manufacturers will really benefit for looking for new workers um, among communities of color and women and other groups of workers that um, haven't been as fully incorporated into manufacturing jobs in the past. Um, and uh, you know, while we work to address the equity issues, there is also unfortunately work that needs to be done to improve job quality issues. Uh, the offshoring that took place in the 90s and the 2000s, um, and also the increased use of temporary workers that, uh, that unfortunately really ramped up after the Great Recession, did a lot to weaken the power of workers to uh, negotiate for higher raises. Um, uh, it, it took a lot of worker power away. And uh, it also increased the, the loss of that power by relying more heavily on, on the temporary workers that um, you know, sometimes earn as little as half as much as permanent workers and don't have uh, any of the fundamental things like um, paid benefits or, or paid sick leave or, or just any of the, the basic things that I think any of us would want in, in our job and our workplace. Um, as you can see on this plot, uh, the blue line is average wages for the whole American private sector for production and non-supervisory workers. And the orange line uh, is, is the same average hourly wages for the manufacturing sector. And then the gray line on top are average hour, hourly wages for durable goods, which is the category that would include electric buses. And um, as you can see, for for a while, quite a while, manufacturing was a well-paid job relative to the other jobs in the private sector. Um, and then that, that in recent years has unfortunately started to go away. And as recently as 2015, 2016, uh, the, manuf the average wage for durable goods started to um, meet and fall below the, the total private sector. So manufacturing wages have not been keeping up, have not been able to maintain their edge relative to the rest of the economy despite the high levels of, of skill and training that can be involved in those jobs. Um, another issue is that manufacturing facilities um, are trending towards being increasingly built in the Southern United States, 
which um, tends to have uh, lower wages than the rest of the country. Um, also, uh, statistically, there, there tends to be higher instances of workforce accidents and harms to worker safety. And many of those states are right to work states, uh, which means it's, it's much harder for workers to form a union and have a voice on the job. Um, all of which is, uh, you know, motivation for finding ways to do something to um, restore the, the, the basic benefits and um, the family supporting wages that manufacturing careers have historically had in the United States. And the tool that JMA has developed to help accomplish this is called the U.S. Employment Plan. It's a policy language that JMA and other stakeholders developed in cooperation with the U.S. DOT in 2015. Uh, in early 2016, um, then DOT Secretary Anthony Fox sent a letter to transportation stakeholders letting them know about the U.S. Employment Plan. Uh, it is language that agencies can put in their request for proposals, and it says to uh, manufacturing firms that are bidding on the contract, you know, please tell us about uh, the number of, of, let's say, electric buses that you'll be able to provide and the specifications that you'll be able to meet and the, the time frame on which you can provide us those buses and how much it'll cost. And in addition to that, um, please tell us, you know, if you'd like to, uh, about you know how many permanent jobs you'd be able to commit to creating if you won this contract, um, what kinds of wage scales and, and benefits would you be able to provide, what kinds of training would you anticipate providing to these workers, you know, because we want them to be able to uh, develop real career skills in the manufacturing sector, and um, you know, would there be any hiring targets that you'd be interested in setting for people of color, for veterans, for women, for returning citizens, um, you know, things that can be done to, to, to bring people who historically haven't had uh, the same level of access to manufacturing careers as others into those jobs. Um, and on the uh, right side of the slide, I've included the logos of some agencies that have used U.S. employment plans. Um, I should also emphasize that uh, whenever U.S. employment plans are included in an RFP, they are always voluntary for bidders. Um, they're never required. However, an agency will usually award a premium on the bid score to a bidder that includes a U.S. employment plan uh, in, you know, in recognition of the, the effort it takes to put that together and of, of the, um, the manufacturer's interest in doing, doing good things to, um, to create good manufacturing careers for folks. And then if the um, manufacturer is awarding the contract and they, they have submitted a U.S. employment plan, those commitments become binding. And there's usually some kind of a reporting framework by which the OEM can then um, share with the transit agency over time how they're doing on, on meeting their goals. Uh, I think it's, it's important to note that um, the U.S. employment plan can, is a really valuable complement to Buy America, which I think, you know, we've all seen has been very effective at created, creating sustained level of demand for American manufactured goods over time. Uh, uh, while, while Buy America does a, a really valuable job of addressing demand, it doesn't cover the issue of job quality, which is what the U.S. employment plan is designed to do um, to, to bring back the, va the valorization of manufacturing careers and make sure that, that they um, can continue to be a solid pathway by which folks can can get access to middle class jobs and support their families. Um, I know that Brianne wants to make sure we have time for questions. Um, I just wanted to show some photos of uh, some companies that have had a lot of success with U.S. employment plans. Um, BYD, I believe, was a, uh, won a contract with their first U.S. EP in 2017. They employ about 500 people right now in California, and they anticipate hiring 100 more in the next year or two. Um, they've made significant investments in apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs, and I believe they have exceeded their goal of hiring 40% of workers from populations facing barriers to employment. Uh, Alstom was awarded a contract from Amtrak with a USEP for $2 billion of Acela trains in 2014. Uh, they committed to creating 400 jobs in their upstate New York facility. Um, I believe that the, you know, estimating conservatively 
the number of jobs that would be created or supported um, through that uh, that contract would probably be over 6,000. Um, so we're seeing uh, clear results from the use of the US Employment Plan. And um, I'll wrap up here. Uh, I think that there's so much great potential for uh, electric buses in the transit sector, both for helping America get really proficient and skilled at designing these vehicles, which many people consider to be a strategic technology. And there's every reason to believe that through the, pr the procurement of those buses, we can spur the creation of more good manufacturing jobs and find ways to strengthen American manufacturing overall, while at the same time providing robust training for incumbent agency workers, and hopefully also expanding and improving transit service to the communities that, that need public transit the most, and all the while also benefiting from the lower greenhouse gas emissions and uh, improved air quality that we know that electric buses are absolutely able to provide. Um, so I'll end it there. Thank you, um, Brianne. Um, more than happy to uh, talk through any questions that folks have. Great. Well, thank you so much, Christy. That was a lot of really great information and um, a bunch of questions have come in already. You all can feel free to keep submitting them. I'll try to get through as many as possible in the 10 to 15 minutes that we have. Um, so I'll start with one on the note that you um, just ended on, Christy, which is about inclusive procurement policies. So can you talk through some of the, um, the current barriers to more widespread, widespread or wide scale adoption of um, inclusive procurement policies like the US Employment Plan? Why, why is there not been more uptake of that? Um, I think that the, the big challenge, well, <laughs> there are several challenges. One is that we're a small organization and um, we like to be, you know, to work closely with transit agencies. And um, I look forward to the time in the future where we have more staff that can collaborate with more agency professionals on a wider scale. Uh, we've had um, a lot of great response from the three main agencies that we've worked with most closely. Uh, LA Metro, um, Jobs to Move America got its start in Los Angeles. Um, we've also had a great partnership with Chicago Transit Authority and, uh, in January of 2018, I believe, was when New York MTA awarded an enormous contract to Kawasaki to build subway cars. Um, so I think response has been really strong so far. Uh, you know, one of the challenges has been that um, I mentioned that Anthony Fox uh, communicated to transportation stakeholders in early 2016 that the U.S. Employment Plan was a tool that the, the DOT found very compelling and exciting, and he encouraged transit agencies to make use of it. Um, uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, President Trump came into office and with a, sort of a different philosophy about the role of equity and the value of making an effort to to do take these kinds of measures to um, create good jobs in more creative ways. And so, it, it was entirely possible um, during the Trump presidency that the the DOT could have rescinded its um, permission to use the US employment plan at any time. We're very glad that that didn't stop uh, the, the agencies that we've partnered with from using it and um, doing a, a tremendous job of creating good opportunities for workers through that process. Um, we're really excited that we have a president now that's so focused on uh, good jobs and worker power and also clean transportation. and. Um, we think that the next few years are going to be an exciting time for expanding knowledge of, of inclusive procurement around the country. Excellent. Great. Uh, and since you are still screen sharing, actually, somebody has asked for your contact information, if you're willing to put that back up and if that's handy. Oh, yeah. Of course. Uh, and just a reminder to everybody, this question always comes in. These slides will be available on Eno's website after the fact, so um, and we'll be sending out a reminder email. Um, as you get that up, Christy, so my, my next question um, is going to be about what are some of the important takeaways from early adopters or agencies that have piloted um, battery electric bus procurements? What are some of the main um, you know, lessons that, that you've seen or, or that um, transit agencies might be able to lend for others? Oh, gosh. Uh, that's a great question. There are so many. Um, I think that you know an important one is to um, connect through all the different 
modes that are available with other transit agencies that have experience and find ways that you can can learn from what what other agencies have um, developed through their programs. Uh, there are, you know, I, I mentioned the reports from the National Renewable Energy Laboratories. Those are great for showing on paper um, the different metrics that that transit agencies have found in deploying their electric buses. Um, and they're also, you know, they're they're basically they're they indicate what transit agencies have been most actively involved in um, gathering this information, and, and those would be the ones that, that would be really great to talk to. Uh, Sunline in Palm Springs, I believe, has been designated as a center of excellence by the FTA in terms of training maintenance workers on electric buses, uh, battery electric buses. I believe there's also a center of excellence in Ohio. I can't remember the agency. Um, and they focus on hydrogen fuel cell buses. Um, so there have been some specific uh, programs put together through the FTA that um, folks can dial into. Uh, of course, APTA is a huge community for connecting different agencies and um, offering dialogue on uh, on how you know how different agencies are are using battery electric buses. Um, there's also the Center for Transportation and the Environment which um, I, I believe they're a nonprofit consulting firm, and uh, they are, uh, what's the word, ubiquitous all across America in terms of working with transit agencies to um, help them deploy their fleets, and they also do a great conference every year, uh, which brings lots of different agency professionals together. So there, there are many different um, uh, ways to, to learn about what's going on. I think um, some of the main takeaways that I found is, well, the one that gets reiterated over and over again is partner with your utility as early as you can um, to start figuring out how you can work together to install the infrastructure that an agency will need to charge and keep electric buses going uh, and also keep them fueled. This is, that's a, can be a complicated question in terms of rate structures. Um, some places like California have been really proactive in um, developing make ready programs where uh, sort of all the standard practices have been established and transit agencies um, have a problem, I think I would imagine a designated contact has already been created at the utility and um, there's, there's lots of good, uh, frameworks so that the utility and the transit agency can work together to establish a rate, uh, utility rates that make sense for the agency and also that are affordable for the agency and also make sense for the utility. Um, that's probably the recommendation that comes up most frequently, I would say. Excellent. A lot of folks are asking about um, private sector involvement. Um, you know, through P3s and, and whatnot, what do you see as the, the main pros and cons, um, or I guess just um, considerations to keep in mind for working with the private sector when it comes to electrification? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think, I have to be honest, that's something that I probably know less about since Jobs to Move America is very focused on what agencies can do in deploying their procurement dollars to um, to you know bring the most benefits to the public that they serve, um, I know that there is an area that Jobs to Move America is working on right now. Also, is electric school buses, and I know that that's an area where there's um, a lot more going on in terms of public-private partnerships. Um, partially because a lot of school bus uh, a lot of school bus fleets are contracted out and managed by contractors. Um, I think that that's an area where uh, there's a lot of activity on different levels from managed charging to uh, operators for the bus fleets to complete ownership and management of the bus fleets. Um, I think that, uh, I hope that at some point in the future I'll be able to speak more knowledgeably on that in the transit sector though. Excellent, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. There's there are a lot of considerations um, in terms of electrification. So the procurement, um, you know, thinking about uh, lower life cycle fleet operation costs, um, new work practices, training operators. 
how would you recommend that um, advocates go about bringing together the various entities that are involved in all of these different um, facets? So, you know, transit agency um, officials, grassroots um, organizers, um, the, you know, labor, how, what are some best practices in terms of um, coordinating across the various stakeholders that are involved in some of these issues that we've talked about today? Oh, gosh, that's a really interesting question. I think that that's um, only going to get easier and easier over time. Uh, one of the things that, um, you know, a lot of the groups and communities that Just Move America works with, um, what they value the most is transparency. And so, uh, you know, the more that a transit agency can open up dialogue with community stakeholders and workers, I think the, the more excited um, different, different types of advocacy groups will be to partner up. Um, I think that that's one of the things that um, I really set out to try to accomplish in the report uh, that uh, I think you can see pictured on the screen. Um, it was designed to be a guide by which all different kinds of stakeholders could learn about uh, what was involved for folks on the other side. I think that I think this is um, changing a lot now. But when I was researching the report um, and writing it in 2018 and 2019, there was a lot of specifics about the challenges of electric buses that a lot of environmental groups and advocacy groups were still very much at the early stages of learning about. Um, and there were a lot of really um, important environmental and health considerations that um, I think could have been useful for agencies to know about. I, I'm sure they knew were you know aware of some of them, but there is such a wide range to consider. Um, and then you know there were also the workforce considerations, which I think a lot of environmental groups um, are are learning more about all the time, but um, may not have been fully aware of, especially on the manufacturing side. And, uh, you know, as we've talked about, inclusive procurement was something that um, a lot of agencies still find to be a new concept. And the idea of, um, you know, how can you create value for workers in the manufacturing sector while also doing the procurements that uh, you would be doing anyway, um, I think that could be really valuable for agencies to understand. And so the report was meant to be a, a guide by which lots of different people and also policymakers um, could get a better sense of, of what was going on for the other folks in the, the big question around battery electric buses. Um, there's been so much dialogue about electric buses since then that I think that it, barriers to dialogue between, between different groups have really come down a lot. And I, I can almost guarantee that wherever there is a transit agency, <laughs> there is a community group or an environmental group or a transit advocacy group that is very interested in your electric bus program and wants to work with you. And uh, if they haven't contacted you already, uh, it, they shouldn't be too hard to find. <laughs> and so, um, and you know, being able to um, give them a, a place to share their, their ideas and concerns with you, I think would be very, very appreciated on their part and um, can hopefully result in, uh, you know, a, 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 an electric bus deployment pr program that can really um, be exciting for everybody. And uh, Jobs to Move America is, is always interested in finding ways to help workers and agencies connect. So um, I, I think that there's, hopefully, this kind of dialogue will only improve and grow over time. Great, and just because one final question that came in was about how transit agencies can access um, inf more information about the inclusive RFP process that you've talked about. This is your report here. I'm assuming that's the best place on your website to find that information, right? Yeah, um, on our website, uh, I believe the section is what we do. There's like, there's headers at the top and there's what we do. And um, one of the, the items under what we do is good jobs. And if you go to Good Jobs, you'll find a link to the U.S. Employment Plan. You can probably also type in U.S. Employment Plan in the search field for our site um, and get taken to a page that has a history of the development of the U.S. Employment Plan, links to sample RFPs, um, links to boilerplate RFP language. Uh, but please, anybody, feel free to reach out to me anytime. I would love to talk with you and be, would be more than happy to try to point you in a direction that would be helpful. 
Well, with that, I think we are out of time. So um, thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. As I mentioned, the slides will be available um, on our website shortly. For updates on Eno's other work, including future webinars, sign up for our mailing list to gain access to the Eno Connector newsletter. Our next webinar is going to be on Thursday, April 29th, and that will look at lessons learned from the mobility on demand pilots in the LA and Puget Sound regions. Um, and if you enjoyed this webinar and are interested in supporting Eno's work, you can check out um, more information on our website or become a member. Thank you to Christy for joining us and to our audience for your participation. Have a great afternoon.